Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm Katie Siegel, and I'm the curator of um, Odyssey, Jack Witten Sculpture. And I'm just gonna briefly introduce Mel. We're super high tech. Mel, I was scared of that. <laughs> Mel went for the, the most advanced <clears throat> Madonna-like technology. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna channel Chris Bedford and just go ahead and say boldly what I think and say that um, Mel Edwards is the greatest living American sculptor. So it's a real honor to have him here today. And in, in addition to being an authoritative or the authoritative voice on American sculpture, he's also the authority on Jack Whitten. <laughs> Um, having been in artistic dialogue with Jack for over 50 years and having been the best man at Jack's Witten, Jack Witten's wedding to marry um, Stykos um, and what Jack called in his log books his mega buddy. So <laughs> it's so nice to have you here and I'm so grateful because I was going to do this talk with Jack and I can't imagine having done it with anyone else but you. So yeah. thank you. Um, Mel's also the subject of a forthcoming exhibition at the BMA in 2019, organized by Kevin Trivilla, our um, curator of African sculpture, around the subject of his relationship with African metalwork. So, um, Mel, thanks so much for being, being here. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for welcoming me here. And uh, Jack was more than a buddy, but that's a good word. You make a buddy. Yeah. So. So this is a this is a photograph you'll see of the you'll see there's there you are right what, looking looking like you're having a really fun time well, um, younger younger <laughs> still still the same handsome man mm -hmm. um, and when we were going through through Jack's uh, photo, photographs and his photo albums to get to get ready for the show in the book we found all these great photographs of you and. Um, Working on the show, you came up again and again, partly, you know, as the subject of these great dinners and events. There's Mary Witten, there's Norman Lewis, there's Weta Lewis. Um, I don't know who these two guys with the glasses are. So again, maybe that's a social media contest to see if you can name, name the archival photograph subjects. Um, so Jack talked a lot about eating and drinking with you, then the log books, the records of, meals had and wine drunk. Um, they're there's, true. They're tr all true. Not all. <laughs> <laughs> there's a great story in 2006, which I didn't know about when Jack came back from Greensboro, um, North Carolina, where we had installed a painting show the, the mm -hmm. first time I worked with Jack. He came back to the studio and found that 9-11 had all fallen on the floor, the mm -hmm. painting that's now at the BMA and the contemporary galleries, and that you and Guy Goodwin and his cousin Tom helped him pick it up off the floor. They did more of it than I, I did, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but a couple hundred pounds of painting. Um, you know, if I could interrupt, that painting um, uh, and his doing it, because Jack was literally in the street when 9-11 happened, mm -hmm. and um, uh, th there was a crew doing some work related to his building, and it was being documented. So they literally, when the plane came over, uh, Jack's voice is on that recording saying, oh shit, look, because the plane was so low. <laughs> And then it crashed, you know, into mm -hmm. the building. And um, later on in the news, they had his voice saying, oh shit, look at that. Later on, you don't hear the oh shit, but the crashes, <laughs> well, you know, they censored things. But that was the response, and it was very close to his studio. Mm -hmm. And those of us who lived uh, in downtown New York were very much affected. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, he he took it uh, as a device thematically to really express something important. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was a really powerful experience for him. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I was writing something for Art Forum right after 9/11. I was actually this is a digression, but it's interesting. And I was polling artists, calling people Ellsworth Kelly, Elizabeth Murray, and saying, you know, have you made art about 9-11? Have you responded in any way artistically? You know, and one by one, they, they said either I couldn't, or they said, I made something, but it's so terrible, I'll never be able to show it to anyone. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually a, a measure of what an impressive artist he was, and a deep thinker, that he was the person that's able to conjure maybe the one successful response Mm -hmm. to that event, which oh, yeah. didn't push it aside, but recognized what a huge event it was. Sure. Um, so 
you came up again and again in different ways with Jack when we were working on the show for the two years. And you want to tell everybody who, who these folks are? Well, there's Jack, uh, myself, Frank Bowling, and William T. Williams. And you could say we, we all met um, between 1968 and, I guess, 69, yeah, mm -hmm. so within a year or so. Um, I moved to, New, moved to New York from Los Angeles uh, in 67, and Jack and I met at an exhibition that we were in together. And then um, William um, I met because the painter Al Held uh, was at an opening of a George Sugarman exhibition. They were both teaching at Yale at the time, and Williams had just, was just graduating. And I had done a photograph of Sugarman's sculpture that was used for his exhibition announcement. Anyway, the short of it is, uh, and then in that year, um, uh, Frank, uh, we met Frank. I don't remember the exact detail. The first meeting, I think, was at his studio when uh, we were getting together to see if we could show together in an exhibition that came from the title, or became titled Five Plus One, meaning five of us were from uh, the US and Frank was from South America mm -hmm. via London. Um, uh, a lot, but there were, you could say, real differences and real coming togethers of this group of people, which represented the, the kind of coming togethers that when you get a lot of people have migrated to cities like New York, Los Angeles, or uh, I guess Baltimore as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we followed each other's work uh, up to the moment, you know, and the conversation. Frank was the one that would go back and forth to England. Jack, of course, uh, through the years would go to Greece. Uh, William, uh, he traveled uh, not as much as the rest of us, but uh, he was very thorough in his understanding of the world and uh, art. And uh, I guess for Jack and I, you could say Alabama, Texas, New York, via California for me. William was North Carolina, New York. Uh, Frank, of course, was uh, Guyana, then London, then New York, you know. And uh, so we mix those things up. And you'll find aspects in the works if uh, it's in titles or it's in thinking. And we discussed uh, aesthetic possibilities, uh, meaning how you do this and how you do that. You like this, you don't like that. Uh, uh, how to cook barbecue ribs or black-eyed peas or all of those things. How you farm uh, tobacco in the Carolinas, you know, just everything. So uh, um, art um, uh, for all of, us, all of us came out of our lives, as all art does anyway, but uh, we seem to be interested in finding aspects of our lives which would feed the advancement of our work and of art. It's so, it's so interesting because, in fact, you would think it just makes so much sense to say art and life are twined together and your life feeds your art. But at that time, you weren't supposed to talk like that. You know, and certainly Frank Bowling, especially, was a follower of Greenberg, and his mm -hmm. own Bowling was the um, the the guy who came from London and did mm -hmm. a lot of writing very much in this formalist vein, very much not impersonal. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that there was a different parallel conversation happening in oh, private. Yeah, because uh, um, I took exception. In fact, I didn't like the phrase "art for art's sake." Mm -hmm. And of course, that was sort of the rhetoric that people gave Greenberg credit for. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, art is made for any sake that human beings uh, want. Mm -hmm. And that's the history of the world. Mm -hmm. Music is made in every culture and every world, you know, every place mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, visual arts made every place. Languages are invented every place, and they're all valid. Mm -hmm. So, and part of that rhetoric at that point was to keep the politics out. Mm -hmm. But that was mm -hmm. political in itself, because yes. if you're suppressing the political, mm -hmm. that's political. Mm -hmm. But um, um, 
you know, I just, uh, I myself really objected to that uh, thing. I said, I don't have to pay him any attention. He's just dumb. You know, I says, he's a, <laughs> I wish everybody could have just said that. Said well, that we would have you missed know, about I, 10 years of really boring art. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, uh, sometimes we have to take the art world with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. And that is that these are just human opinions. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes because of newspapers or writings or, or, or just places that statements are made, they're given more actual importance and people don't look at what the person really said. Mm -hmm. Because right when he said that, artists were doing everything in New York. Mm -hmm. Artists in Los Angeles were doing everything, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the art that was coming out of Japan, you know, and all of them had their historical art, they had their uh, uh, art of 40 years before, and every place has its contemporary art, mm -hmm. you know, and that's just a reality. So you're free to do anything you want. And if there was ever a lesson for me, and I would say Jack shared this, was you were free to invent your own game, your own rules, mm -hmm. your own methods, and see what it looked like. I think that's something that's really clear in the exhibition that you can mm -hmm. see in Jack's work. But you know what? I think he had to leave New York to feel totally free. I think that in Crete, he felt like Clement Greenberg wasn't there. Nobody was looking. Mm -hmm. He could do whatever he want and have this conversation mm -hmm. really acted out. And I think that you see a lot of really narrow, narrow art from New York in that period where people, a lot mm -hmm. of people felt like they had to be really careful yeah. and work in a very mm -hmm. narrow register. Well. I, I don't know whose proverb it is, but it has to do with a dog who has a piece of meat in his mouth and he's crossing a bridge and he sees the image of a dog with a piece of meat in his mouth and he wants the other, so he tries to get that one, which means he drops the piece of real piece of meat that he had and the image was an illusion. So That's <laughs> I, very nice. And, and uh, what I'm getting at by that kind of thing is you've got something inside yourself. It's like our voices. Every voice in this room is absolutely valid because that's what life has given us as a voice. It's what we say with the voice that mm -hmm. counts, you know, mm -hmm. but how uh, each of us sounds is perfect in relation to nature and they're all different, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, I think uh, Jack had that kind of attitude about mm -hmm. it. I was more apt to say it that way, mm -hmm. but that was that was an attitude that we shared, you know. And I think he resonated with you most closely out of everyone, mm -hmm. you know, the many many friends he had. And I think it's interesting that that what's what's different, what seems so different about you is one of these things. Five plus one is different because he's from England, but yeah. something else is different about one of these things because it was a bunch of painters. And you're the sculptor. And did that ever feel like a real split or a real difference? Well, the person who's not in the picture then, uh, but who was in that five plus one mm -hmm. exhibition was Danny Johnson. Yeah. And Danny was uh, a sculptor, a and painter, a if you yeah. will. Yeah. And um, um, uh, how would I say it? I started as a painter. My primary education uh, in uh, the university was... Uh, painting, uh, mm -hmm. you know, football and painting, put it like that. <laughs> you know, but that was my side of things. But in the period of the very early 60s, I had learned to weld. I saw a graduate student welding, and so that interested me. He taught me how to weld. Nothing aesthetic. I was already making changes. Uh, I wrote out for myself, what's the difference, real difference between sculpture and painting? Well, uh, I wish I could find that I wish page of writings. Too, yeah. yeah, no. But the point is, is when I uh, met Jack, he'd gone through similar kind of uh, changes. He started out to be a doctor, mm -hmm. and then he uh, moved into visual art. Um, all of us in life go through changes, and if you use those changes in a positive way, you're a, it's a, uh, something you can use within your work and probably in ways you or nobody else mm -hmm. could have anticipated. Mm -hmm. And Jack liked to find things that were different. Mm -hmm. He liked to know what was going on in the world. He, he was uh, a bit of a musician in high school mm -hmm. and his older brother Tommy was uh, 
uh, evidently a fine saxophonist who uh, passed too young, but Jack always talked about music. And all of us discuss music, mm -hmm. you know, as a, uh, if you will, an accompanying metaphor. And in relation to us as African-American artists, uh, it was clear that the cultural expression that comes from us that had been most public and most appreciated uh, was the musical world, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there were certain experimental mm -hmm. things among the musicians of the 50s and 60s that we really appreciated and got. It didn't you, you can't transfer music to painting or sculpture one to one, mm -hmm. but conceptually you can develop and use ideas from them. And that's what we did. Yeah. And sometimes it would show up in the titles of uh, uh, you know, musicians' works that we were interested in. Mm -hmm. And it was broad, though we were interested in the music from our culture. We were often interested in, as we were in art, all of the world that we could get our hands on, mm -hmm. you know, and have experiences with. So Crete became important to Jack. He talked about Greek music, you know. And so. I think he, I think you talk about music in a similar way, saying mm -hmm. that it was important that um, black artists have a precedent that was radical and ex mm -hmm. being experimental, but also sophisticated yeah. and educated about musical history at the same time. Oh yeah, and uh, you know, um, if if you know a bit about uh, the music of the 30s, 40s, the Duke Ellingtons and Count Basies, most of those musicians uh, were both educated to music, at least in high school, mm -hmm. and then apprenticed in playing in bands and stuff all the way through. So they developed all kinds of ways mm -hmm. uh, and thoughts and understood that any advance in thought you could have in relation to your work could be helpful. Mm -hmm. And I remember, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but somebody questioned Charlie Parker about a different kind of music as if it wasn't valid. And he just said, well, it's all music. Mm -hmm. You know, no. How good it is, that's something That's else. another question. Yeah, you know. But so if all this time, you know, especially in situations like this, Jack was a painter, and he was known as a painter. And it wasn't until the end of his life, we interviewed him last year, um, and he started saying, I'm a painter and a woodcarver. Mm -hmm. But so you must, did you ever think about him as a sculptor? Were you surprised how much sculpture uh, there was? Uh, the quantity of it, uh, I suspected. But I didn't know because most of it was done in Crete and stayed there. But uh, every year or so, he brought back a few pieces. So I understood the directions he was thinking and his uh, interest in materials and the carving part. And I said, well, there's no point in me going to Crete and looking for nails and screws because you've stolen all of them and <laughs> put them in your work and there won't be any. <laughs> you know, But... Uh, um, Jack did the same kind of collecting of forms and ideas for his paintings and taking impressions mm -hmm. of the sidewalks of, uh, you know, various te textural and, yes. things. Yeah, anything that would uh, assist him in creating an, uh, a, a different kind of image, something that was his. Because with all these things that are common and are out there for everybody, it's what you make of them. And ultimately, uh, I wasn't ever concerned that Jack would not do something interesting. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of what did he do this time, you know? <laughs> and the, we were the, that way about each other. It's know? the one question he asked the most when we were planning the show. He's, he kept saying, I wonder what Mel is going to think about all this. <laughs> Mel's the sculptor. I'm the painter. Mm -hmm. You know, like he, like he was getting out of his lane a little bit. Uh, you know, I think... Um, those are categories, and they're fine, and they have their reasons for being. But, you know, uh, your creative thinking can take your directions. In fact, sometimes what you hope for is to get to the stuff you don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, your, your creativity comes out of not doing well what you already know, yeah. but of finding something new within the thinking and dynamics of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, I'm always looking for the surprise in my own work, uh, mm -hmm. and it may not surprise anybody else, or it may not even be noticeable to them. Mm -hmm. 
but these things help advance your thinking with your work, you know, and uh, uh, the variety of materials. Uh, Jack's, okay, this is a, one of my funniest sides, I guess, uh, or odd, in that it's unexpected. In, in one of the uh, assemblage pieces, there's an American Express card. Yes, it's on okay, the cover of the catalog, the cover, yeah. Okay. Well, I have an Alabama story about the American Express story. Uh, uh, express car. Uh, I had a granduncle named Charles Felton from uh, Alabama who migrated north to Detroit mm -hmm. uh, in the late 20s and worked in the automobile industry casting motor blocks for, I don't know if it was Ford, but one of those companies. But I never met him until uh, 1979 and he was in his early 80s. He was blind. And it was the first time I'd ever met Uncle Charlie, and we talked all afternoon about everything, politics and stuff. His wife said to him, Charlie, stop talking to that boy about politics. You know, he doesn't need to hear all that. And I said, no, please, I want to know it. And he says, well, I want him to know what our family thought of, you know, the, the history of the life we've lived in. And he turned to me and he says, you think slavery's over, don't you? And uh, I said, well, Uncle Charlie, uh, we both know legally it's over, so you must, need, uh, you must mean something else. And he said, you got a credit card? What's the implication of that? What's a credit card? Well, I had to do some family thinking. Quickly, I went to my limited arithmetic. The interest rate on a credit card is very similar to the functional profit that happened during slavery, mm -hmm. roughly 25% or so. Mm -hmm. And if you go to, into the books and stuff, mm -hmm. you'll see. Because if slavery wasn't profitable, it wouldn't have lasted two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, it was that kind of an institution. Well, you say, well, this is just a conversation of an old man who uh, migrated from Alabama to Detroit. Well, other, other people who were significant migrated from Alabama, like Joe Lewis Barrow, you know, the heavyweight champion of the world, Jesse Owens, you know, uh, you know, and many others. Well, they went to those places to change their lives, and then they, in what they did in their professions, they changed the world. I think Jack's work is a contribution to the idea that you can be creative in this world. Mm -hmm. And he did it himself through his efforts, and he didn't stay in one place. He did go to Crete. He was he went to the um, synagogue where uh, I have a house, and it was just being built uh, in the early 2000s. 2001. Yeah, I forget the year, but anyway, and uh, I wasn't there. And uh, my friend, the painter Suleiman Keda, took Jack in and showed them what they were uh, building for me. And uh, Jack approved, and he came back and told me so. But he also was very happy because he'd finally gotten to uh, go to West Africa. Mm -hmm. And while he was in Senegal, he also went to the Gambia. And his visit to the Gambia, they uh, put him on a boat and took him up the river, and he could see crocodiles and the wildlife. But when he was in Dakar, that's a very sophisticated modern city. So he could see the variety the context and the growth uh, in that part of the world. And he knew from his days in Crete that the Greek fishermen often fished right off the coast of Senegal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, of course, drank uh, raki and ate fried fish with them. <laughs> I know because I'm still upset with myself because I didn't take uh, his uh, invitation and come yeah. to... Uh, he brought me the raki. If you don't know what raki is, that's um, the equivalent of home-brewed whiskey, you know, home-brewed gin, stuff like that. And uh, it's the old man's It's drink. every bodega in Crete has its own yeah. Oh, yeah, little yeah. Jug, jug of it. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that you and Jack had very different. It was your relationship to Africa. And for, mm -hmm. for Jack, it was... Um, very much about the art. He mm -hmm. had an early John Hay Whitney fellowship, and mm -hmm. he didn't go. He had a baby, mm -hmm. and he couldn't go in 1960. He, bought the, mm -hmm. he, he took care of the baby instead of going to Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, and it would have been, might have been a very tra different trajectory. It's around the same time that you and Howardina Pindell and so many other artists 
we're going a little bit before. Mm -hmm. But so he said, he said, what, le what led to my interest in carving wood? I had seen the African sculpture collections at the Brooklyn Museum and at the Met and reproductions of books on African art, but I did not understand it. The books provided me with a lot of background information, but I, the materials used from what region in Africa, their functionality, but I needed to understand it. I needed to carve wood to understand it. Mm -hmm. So you were making, began making trips in 1970 to Africa mm -hmm. and, and knowing it in person as a contemporary place. Yeah. But Jack knew African art through seeing it in collections. And this mm -hmm. is Jack's first dealer, Alan Stone, who was one of, as, as in addition to showing Jack and de Kooning and lots of New York artists, he was also one of the biggest um, collectors of African art. Mm -hmm. And Alan Stone let him pick up the work, smell it, touch it, as well as Jack going mm -hmm. um, in the, to see, see work in Brooklyn at the Met. So I, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the experience of seeing African art early on in New York. Um, with Merton Simpson, with other dealers? Was that something that a lot of people were doing? Um, a fair amount, evidently, that was going on. I was already uh, exposed in my earlier years in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, um, I was 18 years old in 1955, mm -hmm. and the art history class had a podium. And for some reason, the lecturer, uh, uh, Dr. Russell Cangelosi, who had just come back from a sabbatical in Italy, but he had a little thang um, male sculpture, which has got kind of shoulders. There's one in the, um, in the exhibition. In the Guardian section. Yeah, um, but, um, and I always liked it. And I would just, while they were talking about art history in general, I would make little doodle notes that replicated somewhat the sculpture. And uh, one of my friends says, you're always drawing that sculpture. You know, you, you've been in this class all semester, so what's the only thing in here? And he's just talking about art. I hear that. Mm -hmm. I can draw. But um, what I liked about it, the sculpture, was its physicality, meaning uh, it had shoulders. I was a football player. Uh -huh. You know, I like, an, an athletic man. Uh, uh, was an impressive man, you know. Mm -hmm. It meant he had the potential of doing something, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, a figure, you know, that, that impressed me. Later on, I read about the realities, mm -hmm. and I saw work in, in the museums in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. You know, there were collections. So, uh, and of course, just in the direct studying of art history, uh, Picasso and that whole generation of uh, European artists mm -hmm. who uh, saw African art, you've got to realize the reason they were able to see it was colonialism mm -hmm. and that uh, the colonial taking of goods, you know, which earlier had taken people, meaning us, and bringing us to the United States. Well, when that work hit Europe, um, uh, they could see that there was something in it that might help them in what they were trying to advance in their work. Um, Picasso's didn't really express much from much African art, but particularly the trade sources of France. Mm -hmm. So those works of his come from French colonies, yeah. from Gabon in particular. You know, and they were on the Musée de l'Homme in, in Paris. In, in Paris, yeah. In other words, the, uh, I'm sorry, it's not there now, but in Alan Stone's um, um, uh, collection there, uh, this thing with its mouth open and teeth, yeah, right there, that's a, a piece of large head of a python about this big, and it comes off of the roof of uh, uh, pieces of architecture in Benin, mm -hmm. Benin City in Nigeria. Well, almost nobody's influenced by the art of Benin and their bronze casters, but they're the, some of the world's greatest cast bronzes mm -hmm. are from uh, Benin. Mm -hmm. I know because I spent time there and I go there regularly. Mm -hmm. um, and artists uh, in Nigeria are inspired by them. Well, so, they're, nah, yes, yeah, I won't say, you know, it's just so much and yeah. so many kinds, Nigeria. But not, Afri not Americans. Uh, well, I'm, I wouldn't say that too, because you gotta remember it's the 20th century mm -hmm. and they've got television and cell phones mm -hmm. and uh, the same kind of information. Mm -hmm. uh, naturally, there was less pre, mm -hmm. say 1960 and independence, mm -hmm. 
but at the same time, they already had British teachers in the uh, British colonies of Ghana. Oh, and I meant that um, American artists aren't inspired by the Benin bronzes. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, no, not so much because the imagery, the work wasn't here mm -hmm. to that extent. Mm -hmm. And where it was here, it was pr in private collections. You it's know. very interesting because um, I think in the sometimes in in the West we have a tendency to say Africa like it's all one thing, and you can see Mel is always very specific, like Kev, like a curator, like our curator Kevin Turvola, about all of the different cultures and exactly which things people were seeing. And well, Jack it's like, sees a it's lot. It's like languages, mm -hmm. you know. Each in Nigeria, you easily <clears throat> it could have by language group could have been broken up into 10 different countries, mm -hmm. you know, because there was no Nigeria, but there was Benin, there were the Yoruba kingdoms, there were the Hausa kingdoms, you know, various groups, and they had their own reasons for being together politically, just like Europe. You know, mm -hmm. Europe really just came together uh, in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. If you really look at its history, it's smaller language groups that... Uh, did what they did and came together. And I think Jack was very conscious, sorry for that Ken Burns effect. Um, <laughs> Jack was very conscious of, of, this is from his log books in 1975, mm -hmm. and he says, I'm aware of the fact that this is the tradition in art which I must connect with, not the Western concept of the divine or sublime or romantic or classical, but creating a work of art with a function motivated by the traditions of African sculpture. My way, not Picasso's European interpretation. And he felt very much that he that he had more to say mm -hmm. about African art than Picasso or Matisse, who might mm -hmm. have been just interested in the surface formal qualities and not mm -hmm. about the the use of the objects and what they did. And I don't know if you felt the same way. Uh, similar feelings. Um, um, Picasso had his reasons. Uh, they came out of Cezanne and the other developments of how you paint form and uh, how you uh, open up the imagery that you're working with. Um, uh, you've got to remember, if you, most of us have never looked up the word abstraction. Mm -hmm. We just know if we don't know what it is, it must be abstract. Mm -hmm. That's not a real definition of anything. But we know what extraction, to extract a tooth. Mm -hmm. In other words, abstraction, to take from, and uh, in the case of visual art, to move it to another level. It's more conceptual than actual, but the examples that people give are, say, you take a still life and you then change the form of what was there. Mm -hmm. But abstraction uh, for Picasso, once uh, he'd done what people called total abstraction, he then started to introduce recognizable figures. So people said he's returning to realism. Uh, I take another uh, idea, that is that you no know, Picasso realized that anything could be used in the making of a work of art. Mm -hmm. That is the parts that you recognize, the parts that were not there or mm -hmm. that you invent, and they all can be used and put together in any way that you want. And that was <clears throat> the real significance of his advance and other artists picked up on that idea. And so when Jackson Pollock and people who mm -hmm. were just taking paint mm -hmm. and the material to the surface to apply it, and then what they got was not a replication of anything. In other words, other words you're not trying to paint a portrait or a person or a scene, mm -hmm. but you're trying to p uh, produce an environment of paint, if you will, mm -hmm. on a surface. Uh, when, when Pollock started to reintroduce the possibility of the images of figures in it, people said, he's returning to realism. But I again say no. What he's saying is that anything is possible to be used to make a work of art. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it was a freeing and liberating. It didn't mean that in, nothing, that anything was wrong with the ways that human beings had it invented in the past or would invent in the future. Mm -hmm. Realism never was dead. You know, various kinds of painting of the past still exist and will. And 
It's just that everything is possible. It's just mm -hmm. up to you to make the choice and do something valid, mm -hmm. you know. So, and and I think for for Jack, that that idea that he has something more to say about African art was connected to his background, and that the his feeling, strong feeling about the reality, as you say, that he was brought here, his people were brought here, mm -hmm. you know, from Africa, and that there is, as, as you've said in the essay, Notes on Black Art, the idea of survival mm -hmm. in, in the South, and that some of those ideas and forms from Western Africa survived and persisted in families um, gr growing up. And mm -hmm. I wondered if you had thoughts about the jugheads um, his jugheads, <laughs> which uh, have their references in the, the ceramic jugs that were used to uh, uh, hold, you could say, um, home-brewed spirits, <laughs> uh, but, uh, and they were. But um, um, there's another metaphor that I play with in relation to Jack. Uh -huh. There's a very famous jazz saxophonist and everybody called him Jug. Does anybody here who know who I'm talking about? Does anybody here know the name Gene Ammons as a saxophonist? Well, that was his nickname, the Jug. Jack was a saxophonist mm -hmm. and his brother was a saxophonist. So there could be a whole bunch of ways to relate to a person's uh, work in relation to what to, how much it means in the making of the work. Well, when Jack got to carving the wood and making, you know, these grotesque, uh, expressive faces, uh, um, you know, just out of wood, they're not hollow, they, they're not containers, mm -hmm. they're sculpture, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, there are all kinds of ways for an artist to consider how to develop something. Mm -hmm. And if you can develop something that you feel is yours, you know, your idea for a moment that mm -hmm. uh, the world hasn't gotten to, it usually is a gratifying feeling. I mean, I think know? Jack thought about this work, things like jug, the Jugheads, he said that in private, he said in his logbooks, he said, I'm an outsider artist, you know, <laughs> which is, you know, he's playing because he was very sophisticated, he, he went to art mm -hmm. school, but I think he also has the idea that um, that he's, that there is a tradition of self-trained artists mm -hmm. that he's connecting to, like Lonnie Holly, who was also from Alabama, from mm -hmm. nearby, near near Bessemer, and um, like Lowry Sims has said, that this is a tradition that you're not supposed to talk about if you're a trained, educated artist, but that um, people connect to, especially Black Americans from well, the South. Well, uh, you know, I think I agree with the statement in in base mm -hmm. um, you know most adults are very sophisticated mm -hmm. but they may people may not give them credit for that mm -hmm. because their area of interest and sophistication is different mm -hmm. you know like you said Jack was doing his own thing yeah well not only his own thing but look an individual being creative that's the only thing they can do mm -hmm. you know um, but the fear that you're not doing something that's acceptable, mm -hmm. that cuts you off from your creativity, mm -hmm. you know. And if you're going to move your own work ahead, you know, uh, you have to take the ideas that are yours, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm happy if what I do uh, pleases somebody, and it, if it they perhaps, yeah. <laughs> think. but you know, if, um, but I also am, uh, interested in tomorrow working and I don't know what I'll get mm -hmm. out of what I'm trying to do, mm -hmm. you know, and that gives me another day to work, another I mean, day that to is do a, things. That is know. what's so unusual, one of the things that's so unusual about you both is that you kept moving. Well, as they say, if you stop, you know where you end up. <laughs> 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 but I think, you know, you know, just creatively, you try to do uh, um, you keep trying to do more, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, um, in some ways uh, it feeds you, in, in some ways it keeps you uh, focused, mm -hmm. you know, and so uh, it's a way of life. In other words, being an artist mm -hmm. is a way of, of life, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. in the way you've been given, you know, and if you're mm -hmm. blessed with life and you can make something that you consider is of a level that you call it art, because everybody that paints is not an artist. Mm -hmm. Everybody that makes sculpture is not an artist. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm, I'm just saying, cause we have words Mm -hmm. for if a person really gets developed. They call them maestro, you know, mm -hmm. various in various cultures in the world. Mm -hmm. A person that takes the work that they do, whether it's music, architecture, mm -hmm. or anything, they say, well, he does special stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, it's, he's worth recognizing and pointing out, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we work for that. Not in the sense of the public, though that's that's nice too, but within ourselves. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if I don't think I'll ever forget when I really got a piece of sculpture uh, together in a way that said, "Wait a minute, I've just gotten something that's going to give me something." Mm -hmm. And once that happened, mm -hmm. uh, I knew that I was on on the way with my work, and mm -hmm. I was in my. Uh, 20s at that time, you know, uh, who would know that I'd be sitting up here and in, what is it, in uh, six days I'll be 81, and I've been enjoying um, the, the privilege of trying to make art, um, that I'm in a museum uh, seeing a retrospective, incredible, incredible, a, a, a man... <laughs> You know, um, a person like Jack, you know, I really expected to be coming to his exhibition, you know, and it's clear I'm a bit emotional about it, but um, you can't laugh if you can't cry, and you can't cry if you can't laugh, you know, and that vitality <coughs> that... Um, uh, commitment mm -hmm. um, is there in Jack's work. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Yes, and it's mm -hmm. and it's there in your work. You know, and well, that is the resonance between between you. Well, the the four men in the photograph, and you could multiply them by a hundred, and you could multiply them by a thousand, and all over the world, you'll go and you'll meet people who are interesting, doing mm -hmm. interesting things. You know, mm -hmm. and. Um, um, it, it's just a pleasure and a corroboration of what yes. we do, you know. And this is the, and I have to say, interrupt you and say that's mm -hmm. the great word that you use, corroboration, in mm -hmm. in, in um, interviews instead mm -hmm. of influence to talk about the relationship with African art mm -hmm. or the relationship with other artists is mm -hmm. corroboration, oh, you know. Yeah. And I think Tobias Wolford in that great catalog essay. Mm -hmm. for the retrospective, uh, yeah. does such a good job of talking about how that's a different relationship, that mm -hmm. you're having an empathy with some of the great African artists you've met yeah, yeah. and whose people whose work you've seen, yeah. rather than just being influenced or appropriating. Oh, well, yeah. Well, not only that, you know, it's like basketball. You see somebody jump up and hit a jump yeah. shot from about 40 feet away, and you just want a basketball so you can try yeah. to uh, do that. And if it happens for you, too. Yeah. And then you realize later on, yeah, a lot of people ultimately do that. Mm -hmm. Certain people do it more than others. Mm -hmm. But everybody has got a similar goal. Mm -hmm. Sports are, li are like that. Everybody knows the basket is so high and stuff. Mm -hmm. In our case, we don't know where the basket yeah, is. Yeah, that's the problem with <laughs> art. It, everybody knows who the best basketball players are. We're, it's, sometimes it's a little more confusing yeah, yeah, well. um, confusing with art. I wanted to maybe go ahead and... Yeah. Maybe we go can, back, go yeah. back. I, I, got, I know you want to move. But you tell me you, when to stop. Give, yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, the, the photograph we just saw before this, you know, the tools... Um, These are Jack's tools laid out yeah. in Crete in his outdoor studio. Uh, toward the bottom, the second one up, the ads. Yeah, that one uh, is a, a, a West African uh, ads for carving wood, mm -hmm. and I had given it to Jack. But go to, go back to the next one. Yeah, this one is a work my mind called Baranias, mm -hmm. and um, I went to a traditional uh, blacksmith and mm -hmm. had him forge me. Uh, and adds for uh, carving and this part yeah there is the part that he made mm -hmm. and I used it in my work 
but he was a man about the age I am now. He was about 80, and he would uh, sit in a market in uh, uh, Dakar, a certain mm -hmm. market, and uh, they made, he made all kinds of pots and pans. His sons and grandsons uh, worked with him, and he said, well, I'm getting old, and I'm not doing this much, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I had him make me maybe uh, a dozen different things that he traditionally made, knives for cutting meat uh, and ads like this, or one that was much longer that was used to carve out the, the hollow space in a drum. In other words, um, uh, traditional tools in the world are often very, very specialized, mm -hmm. and they produce interesting forms. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, the kind of artists Jack or I are, uh, you might say, we're interested in unusual form combinations mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have the respect of the uh, traditional world. And at mm -hmm. the same time, the industrial world, mm -hmm. which uses calibrations and uh, cyber control of things, you know, all of those things are potentially Tools. useful. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Jack had very close relationships with the saddle maker and the leather smiths and all the craftspeople in Crete. And mm -hmm. I think that's something really that you share is respect mm -hmm. for all kinds of knowledge. Oh, well, yeah. And not yeah. just um, academic or, mm -hmm. you know, conceptual knowledge. Uh, and it shows in the work. And Jack mm -hmm. made his own tools for painting, too. Mm -hmm. There with them. We just have to stop just because it's such a cute picture. This is what I found in Jack's photo album <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of Mel in his studio. Yeah. A happy uh, man, studio time. <laughs> that was clearly a, a joke photograph because yeah. I was sitting in an element of a piece that I was making, a rocker, but it, we, I put it on the electric chain hoist and hoisted me up. I didn't know that photograph existed so, until now. So I've so. collected scans of yeah. all of those to not, so, so yeah. that you can have them. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say, this is Jack and Aya Galini working on The Guardian for his wife, Mary. Mm -hmm. And just that, um, for both of you, interested in Africa, but also not as a provincial place or a single place, but a mm -hmm. multiple place mm -hmm. and a cosmopolitan place. Well, it's all kinds of places. It's a co whole continent. You know, it's mm -hmm. like... We say America when we mean the United States. Yes. Okay. But it's the whole continent of North America, you know. And I've got cousins that live in Costa Rica. He's from Texas, but mm -hmm. he's living and enjoying life in Costa Rica. Uh, and I, later this year, I'll be showing in Brazil. And my work is already... In, what I'm getting at is uh, the world's possible now, mm -hmm. you know. Um, um, when I first uh, went to Africa in 1970, mm -hmm. um, and I knew where I was going to be. It was a group of uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I told my mother I was going. And she said, well, uh, can I send you a letter? And uh, she sent a, um, a letter in advance of me. And I was first in Accra in Ghana and then two weeks later in Kumasi. Mm -hmm. And this letter was waiting for me. And it was uh, interesting because she was uh, uh, thinking about the idea that she was, uh, you know, a grown woman, a mother mm -hmm. with a son and grandchildren. But she said, you know, uh, think of that girl who could have been uh, free to do anything she wanted and to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and to... Um, live a life without the difficulties that we've lived because of uh, race and dynamics of uh, employment and stuff. Uh, it was all in this letter. And um, I could see, because uh, I had been there two weeks by then, that the dream was good. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, the thought was enough for her. Mm -hmm. because that was the fate of the family up till then. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jack went across the world, mm -hmm. translated Alabamese into yeah. Greek. Yeah. <laughs> you said that at the memorial service, and I thought it was so beautiful that you well, found but, Bessemer in Crete. Yeah, well, you know... I, I'm, one of the artists that influenced him uh, in school days was Ashil Gorky, and Gorky was Armenian. 
And when I first met Jack and saw a painting, it was called uh, Garden in Bessemer. The painting clearly was influenced by Gorky, and Gorky was, one of his famous paintings was Garden in Soichi, I mm -hmm. think it is, you know. And so I knew that Jack was expressing his appreciation for what he learned mm -hmm. uh, from Gorky, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a teacher in Los Angeles who was a friend of Gorky's, and mm -hmm. he would bring Gorky paintings into our classes, mm -hmm. but they didn't look like Gorky's mm -hmm. because Gorky would copy other artists mm -hmm. like Picasso and Cezanne and stuff. Jack's sculpture, um, you know, uh, there's a resonance between all of us. Mm -hmm. um, I was given a set of carving tools in 1971 in Ghana, and I was supposed to then carve up a bunch of sculpture through the years. Those tools are still in my box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're still sharp because they were sharpened <laughs> for me. But what I'm getting at is you can't get to every idea you have. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, in this piece, piece where there's a suspended section of a plow, and this was made uh, a year or so ago, mm -hmm. but I made one 50 years ago in Los Angeles called Earth Thing, and it's about eight feet long, and then at the front end of it is the blade of a plow. Mm -hmm. So, but this one I suspended, that one I run across the ground, mm -hmm. and that's how our ideas go. And I thought it was just so, there were so many things I thought we could have talked about, and I just flashed through a million slides, which <coughs> I won't get to, because I want to open it up to people in the audience to talk to Mel. Mm -hmm. um, but Jack, mm -hmm. you and Jack are the only two contemporary artists I know who use plow, plowshares in your work. This is in Pluto. And you're also, and so it's, they're in Pluto, um, mm -hmm. it's in your work, Agricole, and mm -hmm. then um, you were the, this is Jack's Olive Grove in mm -hmm. Crete, and you were a peanut farmer for a brief moment. Uh, well, I didn't So it's much the only of, two artists I can think of who also have that agricultural uh, background. <laughs> well, my family grew all kinds of stuff when they were up in the country in East Texas. Uh, peanuts, which uh, don't taste these days the way they did yeah. then, but when I got to Senegal, they tasted just like the peanuts did when I was a kid mm -hmm. in Texas, when you uh, put them in the oven, heated them, and that's how they got crisp. And um, on the farm project I was involved in in Senegal, there was a year we got two tons of peanuts. That's so a lot I, of peanuts. I put that on my resume, I guess yeah. you could say. <laughs> I think that's a nice note to end on the last, maybe one last thing is how how incredibly forward looking you both are, you know, and how yeah. much you are realistic about history, how much you people have, the two of you have made history and thought about history and recovered history, but also that you are still always looking to the future and you both have a work called Phoenix. This is Jack's. Um, you know, for the youth of Greece looking mm -hmm. forward. And this is your work from 1963, Afro Phoenix, mm -hmm. Rising from the Ashes. And I just think it's amazing to see that arc of both of your careers and how much it's still, the arrow is pointed forward. So well, he was a dear friend. Uh, um, and uh, how do you say, a reciprocal uh, inspiration to each other. And uh, his paintings and uh, the two of us was good. It was good. good. Thank you so much, Mel. You're Thank welcome. you. I need a copy of this photograph. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's what Mary said. She said, we want that photograph. Uh, yeah. So are there people who have yeah. questions or things they want to say to, to Mel Edwards? Talk, don't be shy. Hi, Mel, it's Louisa. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, thank you for being here today, and you are the most wonderful artist. Um, I had a question about living with one's art rather than just having art in one's home or in one's possession, and um, the difference between the two, how we can embrace art, those of us who aren't artists, in our home and how we can make it a part of our family? Um, all I can uh, really say is what I've done myself is when I make art, so I got lots of it. You know? <laughs> uh, 
no matter how much success is implied, I got lots more. <laughs> See him afterwards. No, no. See the gallery, not me. But no, but um, um, I just think uh, if there's something you like and appreciate and and can have, uh, and you take it home and put it where you uh, feel it should be, you know, uh, I don't think there's any one way to do it. Um, um, uh, I got asked um, a couple weeks ago by the gallery because somebody wants to document some of my work and they handed me six photographs and said, we need to see these pieces because um, we need better photographs. And uh, I says, well, where are they? You know, I, I see one that I know where it is at, at my house, but um, you could say studio is one thing because in my case it is separate. Uh, so uh, I think there may be half a dozen of the pieces that hang on the wall at home. Uh, a, a painting of Jack's, a painting of Sam Gilliam's, a painting of William Williams, uh, uh, any number of African pieces of sculpture. Um, um, uh, painting, uh, though she's not known as a painter, but my late uh, wife, the poet Jane Cortez, um, um, she did paint, and so uh, things of hers are there. Um, you know, home is home, and uh, art is, is your own, is just a part of it. If you're a person trying to build a collection for uh, uh, other purposes, well, then that will guide you, you know. But for me, uh, it's, uh, it's been exactly that. I want to, to be in my living space, and so it's there, you know. And you can see that in Jack's work upstairs. All, none of it was ever in a museum or a gallery. It was mm -hmm. all in his house, yeah, and yeah. all because it was meaningful and meant to be lived with and was important for his family, just like the work by you that mm -hmm. was still hang, is still hanging in this studio now. Sure. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's about personal relationships and mm -hmm. as well as the material objects. Sure, sure. He used to talk about that piece on the wall because it has a teaspoon in it. And he says he goes and polishes a teaspoon every now and I don't have a particular system. Um, I'm probably, um, at this stage, uh, anything that I made uh, in the 60s, I just uh, uh, have kept. If it's small enough to, you know, keep. I think there are two larger pieces. Uh, one was shown here, August the Squared Fire, and it's in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And uh, just to show you how that works, I had that piece from 1965 till a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I didn't have to select by the time uh, a museum got wise enough to buy it. Uh, <laughs> I was storing it. And there's another one at the Museum of Modern Art and it's the same story I made in that year, 65. And uh, they finally bought it. I said, well, they could have got it for a lot less a long yes. time ago. Yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> you know. Jack nah. said that about the Whitney show he yeah. had. He had one yeah. of those Whitney shows, and he wrote in his diary, And because mm. the Whitney bought, he said 40 years later, they actually mm. bought the work. Yeah, Pretty good, yeah. right? You know. Same thing happened with me and the Whitney. No, that's, that's funny. This, you know, but um, I think... The, the, at least the important thing for me in relation to all of that is I was going to make art anyway. As long as uh, I have life, in, one, in some form, one or another, I was going to make art. I didn't make art to be in art business, you know. Uh, the work naturally, uh, ultimately, uh, ends up there. But to tell the, tell the real truth, um, uh, art didn't pay for itself until very recently. I taught and I worked and I did all kinds of other work so that I could make uh, so you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's what I've been doing to live, you know, my life, along with, of course, uh, having family and children and, uh, and grandchildren. Uh, but um, as a teacher, the one piece of uh, advice 
that I thought was pertinent that I gave was to remind them that they'd better be sure they like to make art. We didn't have the word career when I was young. Now artists uh, come out of graduate school presume uh, that they should be able to have a, a major exhibition in a, a gallery. And when I was young, it was, I don't say the world should be like it was when I was young, but, but when I was young, the truth is, uh, an artist around 40 would be feel lucky that he was having his first one-man show, uh, you know. And times have changed. The, the world is different. But the basic thing, uh, if you're going to live your life, you should be trying to do something you want to do because you're going to make sacrifices no matter what. Life demands sacrifices, so at least you'll know why you're, why and what you're making them for, you know. Otherwise, uh, you deal with it as it comes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so my name is Coleman, and actually, Mel, I met you in Senegal with my friends uh, Musana Ali and uh, Kenzie. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we actually had dinner together. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, but um, so hello again. Nice to see you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we had a great time. But the other thing, question I uh, wanted to ask you was about the work that you're doing as far as the uh, imagery of like the chains and um, the uh, sort of diasporic context of your work. And I wonder if that has been therapeutic at all in the process of your making. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, after you worked all day, I don't know if you might need therapy, but <laughs> no. But um, uh, the subject of the form change um, is um, complicated because uh, if you're a blacksmith, uh, you got to remember, or a person that understands the phenomena, chains were invented to be a better rope than fiber by metal workers. If you don't make a good chain, that is if it breaks, it's not, you haven't made a, a functional rope. You're not a good blacksmith. You're not a good craftsman. You're not a good artist with that. Chains as symbol, uh, that's different. It's like the word love. Uh, chains can be connection. If uh, I have car trouble in my studio in upstate New York in the snow in the winter. I'm very happy to see the chain truck come and pull me out of my difficulty. Chains is a device for oppression, which we, when we're talking about history, most slaves never ever wore a chain. Why? Couple reasons. Be too expensive for the owner to chain up everybody and they would be able to do less work. So what held them in bondage were other devices, you know. Uh, I don't mean physical devices, but where could they go? What were the other businesses around? You know, that kind of thing. And I, as an artist, need to understand forms the way poets understand words. So say the word love, which is probably the most common word in poetry in the world, but that all you got to do is bracket it differently. Instead of I love you, you, somebody could say I'd love to kill that son of a bitch. You follow? So a form, a chain, or a shape, or an appearance is different based on what it's surrounded by, you know. And I've understood that very early. One of my sculpture uh, that she did show, uh, we didn't dwell on it, is a large rocker, um, one of the kinetic pieces. And uh, its title is Before Words. And um, it has changed running up one section of it. Uh, but uh, I titled it to kind of poke fun uh, or joke with my wife because she's a poet and words or her means of expression. Okay. And I said, well, you know, before human beings had words, they had the need to communicate. Uh, they had the ability of movement. They learned to me move their tongues 
their lungs, their body. And so we, as human beings, have invented words. We've invented uh, uh, all kinds of forms related to that. So the same thing is true in the, the uh, visual arts world, you know, same thing. And of course, words uh, accompanied by sound, that's music, you know. Um, sculpture that's large enough, and there are some pieces of mine that the reference could easily be more architecture than um, uh, sculpture in the, the sense of statue, you know. Um, I just visited the um, Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, and it was very interesting to me um, uh, for any number of reasons. Of course, it's significant symbolically, but also that it was probably computer generated and produced. I think it was made in Korea, and that's a thing that they do uh, in a lot of places now with technology you can uh, uh, replicate any image uh, that you might want, you know. Well, it's not a kind of tool that I use, but I said, I, uh, and, and most of the artists I know would have said, well, you don't want to do it that way. That takes out the human touch. But I'd like to say that, you know, humans invented the tool. Therefore, it's up to the human uh, creativity to make that, um, use that device in a way that we feel positive about the, the result, you know. So, um, and the scale being architectural that large, that's another, you know, set of issues. Uh, I chose to make uh, the lynch fragments all about this size through the years, and they all hang on the wall, and they're not masked. They're, you know, visual reliefs, but they're not masked. A lot of people want to call them masks because they hang at eye level, you know. Um, uh, so an image uh, like a chain, like my works that are barbed wire, somebody said, oh, that reminded me of uh, that person of a concentration camp. And I said, well, if you read what I wrote about the barbed wire when I first used it, uh, I'm from Texas. I know it was invented to keep the cows at home, you know. But at the same time, uh, I know you can tear your pants trying to cross the fence. And I also know the history of oppression that uses things like that to, uh, you know, restrain human beings. Um, every object, it depends on how you use it, you know, and that's your creativity uh, uh, as a person uh, that should define and give you ways to go. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. This Please. is a question and, a, and an acknowledgement. Uh, as an artist, one of the most important turning points in my life was spending uh, four weeks in Bellagio, Italy in 2006, where I got to meet uh, you and your wife, uh, Jane Cortez. And it was... Who's that? Uh, this That's is that? Paul, Paul Rucker. Rucker? Yeah, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. Great to see you. Same here, same here. Please, let's say hello later. Okay, we shall. Yeah, baby. and um, my daughter told me you were around, so it was a small world, huh? It is. It yeah. is. Oh uh, yeah. But I wanted to say I, I, I'm working at VCU right now, where your daughter's located in, in Richmond, and there's a lack of black faculty everywhere. This mm -hmm. is an issue in black mentorship, and that summer in Italy for three weeks, being spending time with you and Jane was amazing for me. Uh, and that made me realize that I had a lack of black mentorship. Can you speak on the need for that? And yeah, and what can be done? Um, well, the American uh, society has to integrate. We presume that it is, but it's not. You know, I mean, to some extent, certainly it is. Um, you know, it's like any other illness. Uh, and that is, if you don't address it specially, then the illness will continue or grow. That's just the way it is. Uh, in other words, if we want to change American society for positive uh, participation by everybody, then we have to work on doing it. Uh, we can't just say, oh, well, yeah, it has to be, you have a set of tests and everybody who passes these tests does it. 
uh, that doesn't work in families. It doesn't work in any kind of societies. You have to make, as a society, a real effort. We don't have the kind of socio-political uh, leadership or guidance uh, or the ethical vi uh, guidance um, that we need to uh, do that. You just have to, it's, it's like we can talk it um, as human beings, but if we don't do it, it doesn't happen. You know, where there are deficits. Um, well, I'll tell you where I would start it. And it wouldn't just be for that purpose. Um, if you understand that in the, the year, say, 1900, most of the United States didn't have public schools. So most Americans didn't read or write. People don't remember that reality. The, so this country understood that it was embarking on industrialization and that need, needed people more educated in order to be able to work. So they invented or they extended uh, and emphasized the public school. And public schools are the key as far as I'm concerned. Not private ones, public schools for everybody and they shouldn't cost a nickel. And if you do it that way, um, um, uh, it will give the society much more than the society gave by making education free. And all you have to do is be able to count to 10, 10 times and apply it and you'll understand what I mean by that. People will say, well, education can't be free. Well, no, nothing's free. But the cost is whether we cooperate to do that or not. You know, we've got presidential, well, I guess it's called leadership. You know, I have a lot of interesting words, but I don't want, he's, he gets enough time. Um, but uh, just to, uh, there's a, a, a sculpture I made in California, it uses a chain somewhat. It's, uh, uh, they have a promenade dedicated to the uh, speeches of Martin Luther King. And uh, along about a hundred yard area of sidewalk, there are excerpts from his speeches um, cast in bronze. And they were considering sculpture for the site. And I was one of several artists. And I found one um, of his uh, excerpts and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the words exactly, but it said, um, uh, we must uh, emphasize, we must break the chains of hate by emphasizing the ethics of love. And um, uh, since I've been working with chains as a, you know, a, a metaphorical device in my work, I thought this would uh, be a starter for me to make a piece. So if you go to San Diego at the convention center across the street from it, there's this promenade and there's this uh, piece of sculpture that's uh, 20 feet high and about 30 feet across. It's stainless steel, a large uh, uh, disc and one column of chain running up about uh, 18 feet high and it's clearly broken off appearing at the top. And uh, probably weighs about, uh, I think, what was it, uh, seven or eight tons. Uh, and it was installed in 1985. Well, it was one of my ways of grappling with that idea that we still have chains to break. We still have a society to develop and construct. And um, maybe, uh, you know, an artist, that's not what they expect artists to say and talk about. But the truth is, the, the greater aesthetic, uh, and we talk about aesthetics all the time in visual art, the greater aesthetic is the quality of life which we uh, will give to the future. And so, uh, more directly on that issue, clearly I've thought about this because I'm running on. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, when I started teaching, uh, I had no intention of being a teacher. I wasn't against it. I just uh, um, I'd had five years in college and I was trying to be an artist and taking any kind of job I could get. 
1965. I was about two years into the Lynch fragments, the small works, and I uh, was in Los Angeles. And uh, um, then Los Angeles exploded, black Los Angeles, and uh, the rebellion was on. Within a month, I had two job offers at universities. Uh, they already knew about me or any other artist. And you could say that was when affirmative action started with, without even having the phrase. And through my years of teaching, uh, you know, uh, I taught at Rutgers most of those years, but I taught at the University of Connecticut and first at the old Chouinard Art School, which is what you, the art people would know as Cal Arts. Um, um, things have to change by people changing them. But people already know the problems and uh, know the direction of solutions. So what will motivate people to do things? I would hope it wouldn't take the burning down of half a city. You know, I would hope that it wouldn't take things like that. But if we stay with uh, the uh, idea that this already very mixed society cannot interact in a positive way, then it will always be less. And you can rhetorically say, make America great all you want. But anybody with eyes can see its deficiencies. And more importantly, if any of you remember a thing called Operation Head Start, okay, for a government to literally cut out the, the education of preschool children, where are those four and five year olds going to be when they're 20, 25? All you got to do is look at the prisons. Somebody will say, well, you can't make that direct a correlation, you know. Well, it's there, you know. Uh, it costs much more to house a prisoner than it does to uh, give them a college education, you know. Uh, I don't say everybody's ready. I don't say that, uh, you know, human beings don't need incarceration to some extent. But what I'm saying is, what's the emphasis? You know, what's the focus? Where are we focusing uh, what we're doing as a society? And I think those are questions. And a part of being creative is to ask the questions. So Paul, I thank you for the question. I, uh, I don't usually get to run off on this kind of stuff. <laughs> no, I'm ready to vote for you, though. That's, That's okay. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> well, that, that was courtesy for both of us. Uh, fellowships at the Rockefeller Foundation. So I don't have to tell you how symbolic a name like Rockefeller is in American finance, but uh, uh, you, know, um, you know, whatever we develop as a society, uh, uh, clearly if we've gone as far as we have, uh, we can see that there's much more to do and let's make the effort, you know. Uh, you know. It's a, it is such an honest view of history, and like mm -hmm. I said, I'm hopeful, but also the possibility of the future is really there in both oh, of yeah. your works. Oh. And so I wanted to thank um, Jessica Braderman and Gamian Giot, who organized Mel's visit and um, mm -hmm. hosted us tonight at the mm -hmm. BMA, today at the BMA. I want mm -hmm. to most of all thank Mel Edwards for coming and doing this as an act of friendship <laughs> um, and care yeah. for Jack. And I want to invite mm -hmm. all, of Jack, all of Mel's old friends and all of his new friends <laughs> um, to the reception afterwards. Mm -hmm. So please, please join us and ask well, more questions. Thank you, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation to be here. And thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. <laughs>